Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone, and a warm welcome to all our attendees today. Thank you so much for joining us today on this webinar, looking at the optimize, on optimizing supplier management in aviation. I am Claude Murray, co-founder and president at Servion Labs and your host for today's sessions. Uh, a few housekeeping items before we continue. Uh, we will uh, make uh, an email or send you an email with all the webinar slides and a recording of the session today. And in your webinar panel, you will see a chat box where you can submit questions throughout the session and during the Q&A period later on. We will try and answer as many of those as we can. But let me first introduce the speakers to you. Uh, Angela Dickmich, uh, who is a manager IT vendor management at Greater Toronto Airport Authority. Angela joined the Airport Authority four years ago to implement for them vendor management disciplines for their IT organization, as well as the rest of the, of the company. Angela has over 14 years of experience leading teams in the areas of procurement, contract management, and vendor management at leading com Canadian companies such as Toronto Star and Toronto, uh, Toronto uh, Canada Tire. Michael Burns is a partner at PwC with over 18 years of professional experience in transport, aerospace, and defense management and consulting. Michael leads PwC's corporate finance aviation practice and in that, he brings extensive experience in, avia in aviation infrastructure, asset valuation, business case development, and operational performance improvement, as well as the expertise in aviation infrastructure concessions and due diligence. And that includes air traffic management, airport, and a aviation services assets. Michael previously led Booz Allen's aviation infrastructure business in London. Sally Hughes, who I assume many of you know, is president and CEO at IACCM. Sally is the chief executive officer at IACCM. She is an experienced and accomplished commercial and contracts management professional, holding senior commercial positions at a range of corporate and multinational organizations. Sally is passionate about enabling business efficiency and growth through contracting and commercial excellence. She understands the need for robust business operations to drive these efficiencies together with the requirements for effective communication and collaboration. And uh, the two organizers today of the session uh, is ICCM and Surion Labs. And uh, what we will be covering today uh, in, in this is the complexities and challenges of managing the aviation supplier ecosystem. And I think you will get great examples from both uh, Mike and Sally on this. Um, in addition, you will hear how Greater Toronto Airport is using technology-driven supplier management pro programs to deliver and improve performance and savings in that area. And finally, uh, we will get further insights from PwC and IHCCM on driving value through supplier collaboration in the aviation industry. Um, and as I mentioned, IHCCM and Surion Labs are the two organizations that are the sponsors today. And, uh, and with that, I'm going to introduce uh, the uh, first speaker for us, uh, Sally Hughes, who is going to talk about the challenges that we face today. With that, over to you, Sally. Lord, thank you very much indeed. I'm delighted to be joining you today. And um, this is indeed a, a fascinating and ever relevant topic. Um, and what I want to try and do for you today is very quickly provide some context to all of this. You know, statistics show that actually the global outsourcing market amounted to close to $90 billion in 2017. 
um, these are enormous amounts of money. And whilst today we're, of course, looking at this in the context specifically of the aviation industry, managing supplier ecosystems, and, and that really is the key word here, is a focus and challenge facing many other industries, whether it be um, oil and gas, telecoms and IT, aerospace and defense, the list goes on. In fact, I was just reading an article recently um, regarding the pharmaceutical industry where outsourcing continues to increase there as well, with companies spending $50 million a year or more on outsourcing services. But we have to question how well equipped we are to deal with the risks that are associated with outsourcing. And the list that you see on the slide is by no means exhaustive, but these really are key elements for us to focus on. This is a highly interdependent and operational environment. And frankly, traditional roles and traditional practices are often ill-equipped to manage in these conditions. Yet, our reliance on third party providers continues to expand and research continues to validate that point um, and expanding into perhaps more non-traditional functions like real estate and facilities management. But outsourcing actually is beginning to reinvent itself. Organizations are increasingly seeing third party providers as a vital way to drive innovation into their organization. So in other words, it's really becoming a means of potentially attaining and maintaining competitive advantage. It's not just a way to cut costs. And of course, if all we're looking at, if all we're looking to achieve is cost cutting, um, then as the slide dictates, uh, that will lead us down the very wrong path. We need to focus on, on value over cost. So if we move on, overall, companies are increasingly acknowledging that their vendor relationships are evolving into full-fledged partnerships. There's a clear indication, a desire to manage relationships with third parties very differently to maximize value. But managing these ecosystems demands much better contracting, effective and appropriate relationship management, and of course, supportive systems that are going to drive performance. And contrary to the beliefs of some, collaboration is not only relevant during the good times. It is an essential component of the bad times, the challenging times. So some of these solutions on the screen here, um, I'm not going to run through them one by one, but overall, Everyone needs to be bought into a vision. Um, a vision is, is an actually a, a really critical component and equally communication. And communication is something that actually is very often left off but should be high on a risk register because without effective communication and without common tools to communicate with, you're immediately heading in the wrong direction. And at the outset, negotiations need to be focused on driving success. Of course, those familiar with the IACCM top negotiated terms will know that too often we focus our conversations around risk consequence. But equally, all of our measurements as we go through the project need to have the achievement of the outcome, the achievement of that vision in mind. And then finally, we often talk about the link between the contract and the relationship. But these two are not mutually exclusive. They are codependent. The contract is needed to provide that operational guide, that go-to manual. And using it, you can continue to develop and enhance the relationship. But without it, you really are at the mercy of personalities. And then finally, we come on to the ubiquitous topic of technology. It's certainly fascinating from our perspective at ISCCM to, to observe the explosive nature of change. Just a couple of years ago, even 12 months ago for many, technology was viewed as a, as a nice to have, as something that organizations with spare cash would implement. Um, now, it is a must have and particularly 
in the environment that we've been describing, this environment of supplier ecosystems. Companies that don't embrace and implement technologies will rapidly fall behind their competition. So on that note, I'm delighted to hand over to Angela, who's going to take us on um, a journey of the Greater Toronto Airport Authority's journey. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, Sally, and good morning, everyone. I'd like to start off with a little bit about the GTAA, if I may. Uh, we're Toronto Pearson Airport, a uh, not-for-profit corporation operating under a 60-year ground lease with Transport Canada. Sorry, GTAA. <laughs> Toronto Pearson is Canada's largest and North America's second largest international airport, second only to JFK. Uh, our 2017 revenues were $1.4 billion, an increase of $85 million over 2016. A uh, couple of interesting facts. Uh, countries comprising approximately 70% of the global economy are accessible from Toronto Pearson by daily non-stop scheduled service. And we were recently named Best Large Airport in North America and Europe by Airports Council International, which is the global organization representing the world's airports. 49,000 jobs are directly associated with operations at Pearson. Over the past five years, total airport traffic, uh, passenger traffic, uh, increased from 31 uh, 36.1 million passengers in 2013 to 49 million in 2017. We're growing at a substantial rate of an average of 4 point, or 6.9% annually. In 2017, 63 airlines provided service to the airport, offering flights to 37 Canadian and 184 international cities. We have 22,000 parking spaces in four parking facilities, 50 hectares of airport land dedicated for air cargo use, moving approximately 470,000 tons of cargo annually. And there are over 1,600 displays for advertising, wayfinding, baggage, and flight information in the terminal. Like many uh, different industries, airports require a unique set of services. And while 49,000 jobs are directly rela related to the GTA's operation, many of the services are outsourced. In fact, there are only 1,600 full-time employees and 45 work in IT. We understand the importance of the role supplier management plays in helping to keep our operation running effectively and reliably. And through a fact-based, structured interactions with our critical vendors, we're able to proactively manage risk spend, improve the quality of the services provided. And before I get into specifics regarding IT and vendor management here at the GTAA, we'd like to run a short video that illustrates the latest technology used in airport terminal services. If you can run the video, please. air travel typically looks like these days. People checking in for their flight, dropping off their bags, and then heading into immigration to finally board their flight. A lot of people, a lot of waiting, not a lot of fun. Singapore's Changi Airport has launched a new terminal, where a key feature is contactless travel. Now, in theory, that means you go from check-in all the way to boarding and never have to interact with anybody. So, how does it work? Let's find out. I'm old-fashioned, but the use of so much technology in an airport does raise security concerns for me. What if one of these machines were to be hacked? Airport officials say, though, they've been put through numerous tests. And for all the hype that this process is meant to be people-free, there still will be staff roaming around. So I'm going to check it out. See ya.
soon IT will be embedded in virtually all of the terminal services at Toronto Pearson as well. In fact, we're, uh, we're already on our way. So our priority is to deliver solutions that will keep our passengers, aircraft and baggage flowing efficiently and without interruption. For 2018, the IT budget is 62 million, up from 48 million in 2017. Uh, Wipro is our IT services partner and they represent over half of our budget managing and or delivering nearly all of the IT operations at the airport. IT vendor management manages over 200 contracts for hardware, software, and services directly and indirectly. We use a four-tiered categorization methodology with emphasis on the vendor impacts to airport operations and strategic alignment. We have just the one uh, tier one supplier in IT, Wipro, as noted earlier, and six tier two suppliers, Bell Canada, Hartwell, Ascent, EDI, OpenText, and CEDA all of which have a direct or indirect um, uh, impact to the airport operations or are strategically aligned with GTA and our vision for the future. So IT needed to implement vendor management capabilities a couple of years ahead of the corporation here at GTAA to deliver supplier management services. Knowing that eventually the company would catch up, we collaborated and aligned processes and tools, I will speak a little more about that later, um, that would eventually be deployed across our organization. So there are, are two separate entities at the moment for delivering supplier management services. So why did we need IT vendor management? Um, stakeholders were left on their own to manage suppliers in addition to their day jobs. There was a lack of understanding exactly where we spend, why, and the risk exposures. We have um, ad hoc interactions with suppliers, reacting to issues, and many escalations. And IT was changing. So there were the contracts that we were, and so were the contracts that we were executing. We needed to centralize contracts and artifacts to offer one accessible archive and audit trail, and inject consistent governance, reporting, to manage contract performance and compliance, uh, deliver the value proposition, most importantly, realizing cost savings, reducing value leakage and risk were key to securing our footprint in the organization. Uh, doing this required multiple spreadsheets and drove effort in the wrong areas. Focus was on the tactical efforts versus strategic oversight, which was our, our initial intention. So a new, new approach to IT vendor management was born. Uh, we, we knew we needed vendor management disciplines back in 2014 and that it must be ready to manage the future state that was expected to be deployed in 2016. So in 2013, uh, two years away from going to RFP for IT outsourcing services, we had an incumbent who delivered traditional outsourcing services in your typical ARCS rooks cost model, which was focused most mainly on dollars and cents. GTA's growth rate and changes to how we process baggage passengers and planes were major drivers in changing the IT services landscape, and we needed a service provider that would help us through that journey. So in 2014, we identified the need to implement vendor management to manage vendors in this new ecosystem. We transitioned a small IT sourcing team into a strategically focused vendor management team, established a framework, and soon realized we needed a tool to help us to manage it. So we engaged supplier management, went to market, Zirin was selected as it aligned with our framework and could deliver the robust reporting features that we were looking for and capabilities. Um, and they were key to delivering value to our stakeholders. This was particularly important because it promoted tool adoption. And alignment with corporate supplier management was critical to ensure its longevity. So in 2015, we launched our uh, IT blueprint with a nine-year outlook. We went to RFI twice and on RFP, selected Wipro as our IT services partner. And we entered into a contract that was a little different from your traditional outsourcing model as a fixed cost, all in agreement, and it's an outcomes-based delivery model. Partnership was key to our success. We needed to make sure that our partner was, was sharing the risks and the benefits. And acting as an integrator for all IT services, Wipro took over 70 of, their, of our existing IT contracts, transitioned them as subcontractors under the new agreement. As I mentioned earlier, we have two distinct organizations providing supplier management services, corporate supplier management and IT vendor management. As a result, we needed two slightly different process workflows and segregated data to meet both of our needs at the time. 
Syrian was able to do this for us. To secure buy-in across the organization and in uh, vendor communities, we focused on contract performance first, obligations and deliverables, and uh, buy-in by the obligation owners and the vendors promoted tool adoption. This was imp an important step in our change management process. Um, some of the insights that we had, hadn't considered early and later realized was that Syrian's reporting capabilities delivered an audit trail we found to be invaluable when a contract audit was triggered. And suppliers take obligation management very seriously. Everything is on record, good and bad. So I'm going to show you a screenshot of uh, my Syrian dashboard. You'll notice up in the right-hand corner the action items. My team open their dashboards each morning to check on any action items that they need to, 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 to take action on, on th that day. Uh, we also receive email notifications when actions are required. And in the bottom left, this is the contract performance status of the Wipro contract specifically. You can drill down on this data very quickly just by clicking on and getting to the details so that you can um, focus on what's important and what, uh, what gaps you need to address uh, at that particular moment. Our executives can access their own dashboards for uh, real-time status updates on all uh, contracts consolidated or on specific contracts. So we rely heavily on Syrian for day-to-day -day management reporting of contracts, performance, financials, risk, relationship, and contract management for all of GTAA's Tier 1 and Tier 2 suppliers. We have 30 active users at the GTAA, six are in IT vendor management and supplier management. The remaining 24 are obligation owners, and there are also 26 vendors who are actively participating in the tool. We're implementing a contract change order workflow, and we're considering additional functionality related to risk management and contract authoring. In regards to benefits, Syrian provides a single source of truth. The reporting capabilities drive out the facts, and early adoption lead to credibility of the data. It's, important, it's improved uh, supplier performance and service quality. As active participants in the tool, the vendors are motivated to deliver. Uh, value add, as mentioned earlier, we realized firsthand the power of the audit trail as we wrap up an internal contract audit. And institutionalized governance, having a single repository that links meeting minutes with issues, actions, drives closure instead of repeating problems and ongoing issues. So looking ahead, this quarter, we'll be launching the, ch the change order workflow process in production. This will reduce change order processing time by introducing dynamic approvals and giving us the ability to report on and take corrective action on bottlenecks. And we are implementing archiving capabilities to further centralize data. We are, we are about to implement a process for the sign-off and collection of uh, root cause analysis reports to ensure that all SLA remedies are properly captured and documented. Thank you. I guess I'll be passing it on. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much. Um, my name is Michael Burns. I'm, a, as Claude said in the, his introduction, I'm a corporate finance partner based in London, but I look after the aviation sector globally for PwC. My main focus, my everyday job, is actually buying and selling airports. Um, and I do that around the world. I work with governments who are looking at corporatization and financing, uh, finance raising, and I then work with private investors and with airport management teams who are undertaking transactions. A lot of that transaction activity is driven by several factors driving change in the aviation industry. And that, that, dri that driving of change is around massively increasing passenger flows, changing aviation markets, and changing business models within airports. And what I want to discuss in terms of my presentation is to give you a high level view of what's driving that change and how that is driving not only complex projects within airports, but also complex and new supply chains. And then, and new suppliers, because the services and activities of airports are changing. That means there are also new stakeholder communities that need to be engaged. And now for the first time, airports are working in different sectors and shouldn't just see themselves as being part of the transport sector or transportation sector, but it in fact is much more integrated into consumer 
into data management, IT, finance, and other areas of the economy. So I'll talk a little bit about how, how this works. So we are seeing rapid changes in infrastructure, technology, and the business model. And that drives new management initiatives, which drive large scale and complex projects. To give an example, uh, I'm working with the board of Western Sydney Airport right now. Western Sydney Airport has a budget of around about four and a half billion US for the creation of a new airport over the next six years. We also see at Heathrow a new runway project being implemented, which has a budget of approximately 20 billion US dollars. These are large, complex, multi year projects that impact not only the local airport, but also the local city, the region, and the country around it. Traditionally, the airport business model was relatively simple. It is driven by traffic, passengers, aircraft movements, volumes of cargo. Airports traditionally have always derived their revenues from aeronautical revenues, so those are the charges to airlines for landing and taking off, uh, and for servicing passengers through terminals. However, increasingly what we're seeing is non-aeronautical revenue and particularly property becoming a major part of the business and the revenue uh, sources for airports, whether that be in retail or in food and beverage and car parking, which we have seen traditionally develop uh, as significant businesses over the last 20 to 25 years, but also in terms of property, and the air development of airport cities, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. On the cost side, clearly there are large costs in terms of capital expenditure. Airports are hugely capital intensive. You can't build half a runway. You have to build the facilities and the infrastructure for years and years of future growth. And it will take you a long time to actually fill that capacity. But at the same time, operating expenditure is increasing rapidly. One, because levels of customer service are increasing, but also the range of activities. And in those countries, especially where governments are not directly supplying airport security, security is often the largest operating expense and is usually a third party cost and one of significant concern. And this is a cost that is unpredictable as new security threats. Uh, are realized. We change the technology, we change the security requirements, and that therefore will change the job description and the cost of that security activity. Then all over this, you have governance and management by airport, by the airport management teams and boards. And then you have external regulatory authorities looking at economic security, capacity and safety issues. So this is sort of the traditional way of looking at an airport and looking at an airport as really a transport facilitation infrastructure. And if we then can move to the next slide. However, the concept of the aerotropolis or airport city redefines the airport to something which is much broader and much more integrated into the broader economy and therefore for the airport, looking at its investments and projects and its stakeholders, a much broader playing field. So we have what I describe as Aerotropolis uh, 1.0. These are the activities that occur on and around the airport that are directly related to the airport. So activities such as air cargo facilitation, so freight and logistics uh, hubs. Uh, we see uh, uh, airport. Uh, service activities around telecommunications and passenger services. We will see accommodation hotels actually on the airport. We will also see um, uh, the development of businesses which are supporting airlines, travel, and the freight and logistics business. But outside of this, we're seeing a range of businesses and industries being attracted to the airport because of the connectivity brought by the airport, the high quality of utilities and services at the airport, and the fact that airports usually have great surface access to bring employees, great roads, and increasingly 
better public transport and rail connectivity. That means we're seeing uh, aerotech businesses placing themselves around airports, conference centers, hotels, leisure facilities. We're seeing broader infrastructure. So we're seeing second cities being developed where downtown urban areas are being renewed and there is the need for alternative city centers, new commercial real estate, for instance, logistics centers, as we've talked about, higher education and health. So we're seeing uh, uh, hospitals and we're seeing universities being developed, uh, campuses around health and education being developed uh, just outside of the airport, but related to the airport, and even residential developments where airports are able to sector off land nearby the airport, which are not blighted by noise and emissions, and actually grow a, a residential base to support not only growing populations of cities, but also the growing workforce of the city themselves. Now, this environment is far broader and requires relationships in projects far greater than the traditional supplier base, technical supplier base and service supplier base of the airport. But it also means the airport is now getting involved in much more complex projects with multiple layers of government and interacting with the private sector in many new ways. We turn to the next slide. So what is driving this change? So at PwC, we talk about megatrends uh, and how they will impact on airport development. And I'll talk a little bit about these megatrends and how I see those impacting that airport business model. So the first one is demographic and social change. We are seeing increasing middle classes, especially in India and China, and that is changing the way that some airports in developed countries are actually uh, working. So traditionally, uh, we had a lot of airports which were dominated by outbound traffic, so that was traffic leaving their countries for trade and leisure purposes. In Europe especially, we're now seeing an increase in inbound traffic, traffic from China, Southeast Asia, India, South America. And that is because of that growing middle class in those countries. And that means the airports have to think about services, not simply for their local population, but increasingly for an international community. Populations increasing also means that we are seeing cities emerging that require significant new infrastructure. In China, they're building over 20 brand new airports of over 5 million passengers uh, in, in capacity. These are significant cities that nobody, nobody has heard about, but which are going to be leading travel destinations or generators of travel over the next 10 to 15 years. We're seeing shifts in global economic power. So we're seeing increasing economic activity in India and in China and in Southeast Asia, especially countries such as Indonesia, with large populations and again, an increasing working, uh, sorry, middle class. That shift in economic power means that where people want to travel and how they travel significantly changes. Just to give you an example, I was working with uh, an airport in Mauritius where we were looking at a quadrupling of traffic. And I was asking the question, but how do, will that work? Because the number of hotel rooms wasn't changing on the island. And they said it's because we're changing from focusing on European honeymoon couples who stay on average of two weeks to Chinese leisure uh, business travelers who travel on average every four uh, for, and stay on the island for four days. So those, that same hotel stock was now generating four times as many passengers. And therefore the airport had to react to significant increases in traffic and develop projects around that to develop that capacity and that new service. Uh, but it had to do so without actually a prediction of significant increase or what hadn't been predicted as significant increase in traffic. Rapid urbanization is leading to new cities and airports are key. It is far cheaper to build an airport than it is to build a long distance high speed rail network. Uh, and in many countries, which are island based economies, only through airports are you able to gain international connectivity. So, rapid urbanization is causing growth. And then, climate change and resource scarcity. 
Climate change is changing the way that we operate airports. So we are looking now for carbon neutral airports. We are looking for the electrification of airports. So rather than using diesel uh, tugs and vehicles, uh, we're now moving to electric battery powered vehicles. Uh, we are looking at terminals which save water, save electricity, uh, actually generate their own power, their own water, their own heating and cooling. These are all, again, generating products and services. The airport, as a utility provider and generator, than simply as the landlord that would distribute utilities uh, generated from outside. And then overarching all of this are the technological breakthroughs. The way that the customer interacts with the airport, with the airline, with the metro system is changing. And the way that the that the customer even interacts in terms of retail, which is very important for airports, is changing. No longer, and we're seeing this with lower retail per head numbers around the world, no longer are passengers simply going to assume that the cheapest product and the most convenient product is the product they see in the airport shop. Increasingly, brands are pushing uh, forward with experiential services for handbags, watches, other consumables, knowing full well that the passenger is then going to look, feel, touch the product, choose the product, get on their mobile phone, and find the best price anywhere in the world, and then order online. Now that changes the way that airports make money, because traditionally airports made money by effectively sticking their hands in the till. Now airports need to look at retail attribution. They need to be able to track and identify passengers and then be able to work with retailers to show that that passenger actually purchased from that brand and therefore a level of payment is then made to that passenger. This will completely change the way that airports will move. Airports will move away from being simply shopping malls uh, with a runway attached, as often described, to much more interactive and service orientated uh, activities. So if we go to the next slide, So what does this actually mean in, in, in terms of major projects uh, and in terms of how things, how things change? So to give an example, we've all seen the growth of the Gulf and we've all seen the stories in the growth in Dubai and with Emirates and then with Abu Dhabi, with Etihad and Doha with Qatar. This growth was driven both through a recognition of the change in demographics around the world but also through new technology. The fact that the A380 effectively gave uh, the Gulf a strategic position to connect not only Europe and, and Australia on the kangaroo route, but also to provide the Gulf with connections through to South and North America, and then build those connections into Asia, and to develop Asia to Africa, Asia to Latin America type trade, which had never really been facilitated before. What we have seen is the growth of these super hubs in, in, in the Gulf. And there's been a lot of questions about whether this is a new model that is here to stay. I would argue, though, that competitive challenges are already being seen in terms of the Gulf. We're seeing a brand new airport with the capacity of 150 million passengers, the largest airport on Earth, being now opened in Istanbul. And the geographic position of Istanbul means that Europe to Africa travel travel, rather than going through the Gulf, which has been able to cut prices, will now be cut by up to three to four hours. So even the Gulf is now seeing new competition. What we haven't seen are major hub players really flexing their muscles out of China. Chinese carriers are focused upon the almost unending demand domestically within China. However, as we move into the future and we look at aircraft orders, we know that the Chinese will be developing mega hubs and they will have significant fleet backed by local and national governments. So again, we will see shifts in traffic and that fl flows down to individual airports everywhere in the world. And that will then drive projects around efficiency, around changing uh, their market responsiveness and connectivity requirements for their local communities. We move to the next slide. 
Automation also changes the game. Automation allows us to increase capacity in terms of our runways and through, and through improved air traffic control. But one area of automation I'd like to talk about is around uh, 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 automated uh, motor vehicles and cars. At the moment, 80% of the non-aero revenue that is generated by US airports comes from car parks. If you have self-driving cars, they will not park in the most expensive car parking that's available. They will park at the cheapest car parking that's available. This will have a significant impact on airports who have built infrastructure with investment plans for 20 to 30 years around the current car driving model. I would suggest that any projects that are looking for a payback beyond 10 years are going to face difficulties. Now, airports, though, could flex their model. Do you partner with a Google and with an Uber to provide the infrastructure to actually support a fleet of two or 3,000 vehicles for your local city, where you will store those vehicles, clean those vehicles, uh, charge those vehicles, with great access to freeways and to uh, service access roads into the city? That's the sort of thing that airports are going to have to change in terms of their future business models. And all of a sudden, in terms of airport procurement, people are going to have to think about, actually, it's not about getting a third-party car parking provider. It's how do we work with huge technical corporations who are making strategic bets in surface transportation so that we as an airport can actually play in that game? And how do we make those investments? And how do we partner? And how do we track those partnerships? Move to the next one. And that then leads me to with my, my last slide, where looking at the digital challenges, I would argue that airports have traditionally been infrastructure monopolies, uh, based and a monopoly that has been based upon a runway and terminal infrastructure and transport infrastructure that is very expensive to replicate and which has always been, in its formation, state sponsored. In the future, airports will be shifting their business model much more towards becoming digital monopoly. I've described the changes in retail. That means the way that you do your contracts in retail will change. One of the recommendations I make to a lot of my airport clients is that in your retail contracts, you should be making sure that your retailers do not have the ability to put their own Wi-Fi systems in place, do not have the ability to collect customer data unless it is shared with the airport, and in fact, that you're in a position to charge users, not necessarily consumers, but the users and benefiters of that technology in the same way that you charge for electricity, water, gas, and other telecommunications on the airport. I think that airports increasingly will find value in the data that they collect. And that's going to be key in the future because they won't make money necessarily through how many passengers are generated or how many fees they make through flights, but by the fact that they generate data, can sell and develop data. And we're seeing huge digital organisations being created around airports. MAGO, which has been developed by Manchester Airport uh, in the UK for its multiple airports here and is also operating in North America, is a good example of that. And that leads me to data being an asset. And if data is an asset, that means complete changes in the way that we think about the digital infrastructure around airports. Not only is that driver in itself multiple projects, but also as data becomes an asset, how does that impact your supplier network and your consumer network? And how do you map and manage those relationships? And then finally, everything is a service. Moving from port to push. To give you an example, we worked a, a, a data trial at Manchester Airport whereby passengers were arriving uh, at check-in counters. There were queues. We could identify the passenger. We could identify that there were queues at security. So push offers were being made to them on their mobile phones to say, well, for $5, you can use VIP security where there's no lines. We were able to identify passengers who were on delayed flights 
and we were able to say, actually, we have an airport lounge, and for ten dollars, you can use the airport lounge because we know your flight's been delayed by two. Pushing services, moving away from port, is very, very important in terms of the future business model for the airport. But again, it means the airport is dealing more directly with the consumer and is providing different types of services and different types of products. So I'll close there, but effectively what I'm, what I'm talking about is a changing digital environment, a, day, a changing competitive environment in a sector that is growing rapidly as traffic grows and as population grows. In order to control this, in order to facilitate this change, airports are going to have to change the way that they look at suppliers, the way that they look at stakeholders, and they need to think about how they manage these processes as they move forward into the future. Thank you. And I'll pass over to Claude. Uh, thank you for that, Michael. Really very interesting and very insightful uh, to look at that and see the challenges that is coming down the line for the airports. And with that, um, I want to use an analogy because I think for me, this is what really hit at home for me when I think about supplier management and how to go about doing that. Um, when you learn to fly on instruments, uh, the instructor will repeatedly tell you that you cannot stare at one of the dials for too long. You have to constantly scan the dials and go from one to the other in order to make sure that you are in control of all aspects of that plane. For me, supplier management is exactly the same and works exactly the same. And as you can see on the next slide, that is exactly what we have done at Sirion Labs when we designed the software. We look not only at one aspect of supplier management, but it's the integration of all the pieces from contract authoring to contract management, to performance management, financial management, the relationship and the risk management aspects. And you cannot just focus on the contract, you cannot just focus on the relationship, you cannot just focus on performance. You have to constantly look at all of these aspects in order to do supplier management uh, at an adequate level. So for me, a very big uh, comparison there to what happens in the cockpit in, in an airplane. In conjunction with that, as Michael had mentioned, you will see on the next slide, that the services component in the transport and logistics industry has increased dramatically. 30 years ago, even 20 years ago, we were looking at about 18 to 20% of what was bought were services. Today, that is 63%, and as you heard earlier, that is rapidly changing as well. That, again, tells us that in the way in which we need to approach supplier management needs to be very different and needs to focus on what happens after the contract much more so as than what happens before the contract as you typically do with goods. And that in turn is what where the focus is in Surion Labs on the contracting uh, or the management of contracts. This resulted in some benefits, as you will see next. Uh, in terms of, and can we move to the next slide, please? Yes. Um, in terms of the savings that are, pretty, are generally recognized in the industry, somewhere around 12% of annual contract value, uh, we see the hard dollar savings on a continuous basis with our customers around 9.78% or just, just under 10% of actual hard dollar savings by managing all aspects of supplier management in a proper way. In addition to that, and I think in many ways equally important, is the efficiency that needs to be driven. As the work increases, as the challenges increases, the complexity increases, the traditional ways of trying to do supplier management simply doesn't work. So with the right set of tools, 
you can reduce that effort by uh, for about 45 to 50 percent in terms of the effort required to do that. And that is critical in today's environment. And what is interesting about this is this kind of savings or, in if, or, or, in, or efficiencies that are gained is not only on the client side, but also on the supplier side. And that helps both sides to be more effective and more efficient as they go. With that, I am going to uh, open us up for questions. Uh, DJ, if you can give us the questions that were asked, and we will ask the panelists to, uh, to respond to the, uh, the questions uh, for as long as time permits. Sure, Claude. Uh, so I'll, I'll just uh, look at the questions and pass them to the to the speakers. So the first question is for uh, Angela, and this is uh, related to the Greater Toronto Airports Authority organization. So Angela, the question is, how difficult or easy was it to establish a need for this transformation internally within GTA? And uh, related to that, what were the key propositions around which you put together the internal business case? Oh, thank you, DJ. Um... Well, actually, it wasn't that difficult at all. I think uh, from, well, once we realized that in order to meet our vision of being the, uh, the best airport in the world, we needed to enter into relationships with our suppliers that would help us to get there. Our focus shifted from cost to the quality of the services that were provided. And with that, we were entering into more complex agreements um, to drive value and improve quality of services. You need to invest in supplier management capabilities to institutionalize vendor uh, interactions and reduce value leakage and risk. So bringing that value proposition to the table made it quite easy for the organization to see how, how much it required to add the, uh, the supplier management capabilities here at GTA. Thank you, Angela. Uh, okay, we have another question. This one is for Michael. So the question is, uh, how should airports approach passenger experience differently in today's digital age, where the experience at the airport is competing with the consumer's experience with an app-based service provider like Uber? I think, that, I think the key word is partnership. Um, the problem for airports is that while you are servicing customers, you're servicing customers at the airport and only during uh, that travel experience or interaction. So what you need to be able to do is to partner with those players which are dealing with the consumer all of the time uh, across all modes across all regions but which will be dependent on you as an airport because you're providing not only key services but effectively key gateways uh, and key data collection points that allow them to actually run their business so i would see that for a google if google wanted to move into the trouble travel space aggressively uh, against, say, airlines, they would need to partner with airports around the world because it's through airports gives them an alternative channel to collect data, manage data, and provide digital services. So I think the key thing is partnership, and that changes the way that you think about suppliers, and it changes the type of suppliers because rather than you dealing with smaller suppliers, which is the way most airports would work, your largest customers and your largest uh, interaction is with airlines. Actually, if you're dealing with global data providers and service providers, your position uh, in terms of negotiation changes. And you have to really think about what the what your value proposition when you go to the negotiating table to provide to, to get those contracts and those back agreements. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Okay, we have uh, another question. This one, Claude, I think you can answer this one. Uh, the question is, is there a way that the management of supplier contracts can be tied to and aligned with the management of customer contracts? Uh, thanks, DJ. Yes, that's a, that's a very interesting question. I think traditionally what happened between an organization and their suppliers were very siloed compared to what happened between the organization and their customers or their clients. The reality is that when you look at contracts, 
it's very much the same thing. It has T's and C's. It has now in the services business service levels or KPIs that needs to be met. A relationship needs to be maintained. There are risks on both sides and there are financial aspects on both sides. It is essentially the same thing that you are just looking at from a different perspective. I think more and more we see organizations that don't do not think in of supplier management versus customer management separately. They are starting to combine that. They are using for technology that can combine that. And they are looking at processes that are consistent across the board. And increasingly, we see that happening. We see the technologies that can accommodate that and even pass through obligations that I may have towards my customer that I may pass to my supplier or subcontractor and I need to be able to manage across that at all times. So the trend definitely is in bringing the two closer together rather than further apart uh, because the services are getting closer together and the way in which you have to manage it uh, also is more and more consistent over time. Thanks, Claude. Uh, now we have multiple questions around this point. I'll just pick one. Uh, and I think, Claude, you can answer this one as well. Airports procure a wide range of services, including facilities, management, catering, security, etc., that are very different from IT services. How effective is the use of technology in managing such non-IT contracts? Okay, that's a, that's a great question too. Uh, what, again, what had happened in the past was that technology developed in silos because from a functional perspective, uh, there was contract management or there was performance management or there was risk management and technologies because organizations were siloed developed that way. Uh, I think as we've illustrated earlier, when you start to merge those functions together and you design technology that goes across the functional boundaries within an organization, you get significantly more benefit. Much of this originated from the IT space because that's where the traditional service levels, KPIs uh, came from. But today, when you look at facilities management, you look at finance management, you look at even oil rig platforms, it's all the same. There are services. Sometimes they are wrapped around goods. Sometimes they are standalone. Those services have certain KPIs and service levels. There are certain other obligations that needs to be met. And technology has now gotten to the stage where you start to see technologies that are completely product or service agnostic. And that is because that is where the market is going. You can't have a different system in for this type of service versus the, another type of service. It would simply be unmanageable. So technologies, particularly in the post-contract space, are rapidly moving to an environment where it does not really matter what type of technology uh, uh, services manage. It can be managed by the same tool. And I think uh, the uh, example at Greater Toronto Airport is a great one where uh, they manage many different services uh, on the same platform today. Thanks, Claude. I think we have time for one last question. And this one is for Sally. Uh, how does the aviation industry compare to other industries in terms of its sophistication in managing strategic suppliers? Well, thank you, DJ. Yes, that's, a, that's quite a big question really. And I think, um, I, I'm not sure whether Claude you would agree, but I think we, we see pockets of sophistication in different industries and different regions. Um, how does aviation compare? Uh, I think it's interesting because I think the, the focus being on the customer and the customer experience, as Michael has eloquently talked about, um, and this concept, which I love, of the aerotropolis means you know, they've, they've got a tangible joint goal and absolutely there's a, a, a huge use of technology. Uh, I would argue that they're perhaps ahead 
um, in their use of technology. Uh, and actually, you know, it was great to see that video and, and that demonstrated that point very clearly as well. So all of that would lead us to believe that the aviation industry is doing a lot right, but sure, there's always room to do more. But I think there generally are other examples as well. I mean, I think Heathrow Terminal 5 was a great example. The construction of was a great example of collaboration in practice. So it's certainly an industry um, that has some sophistication and, and, and has some examples which can be emulated. Thank you, Sally. Uh, with that, we've actually run out of time. So uh, we'll just uh, close with the next steps. Uh, so at the end of the webinar, you will see a survey. If you can fill that out and give us your feedback, uh, that will be great. And we will be sending out uh, a link to the webinar recording along with a copy of the slides to everyone. So just uh, look out for that. And we hope that you join us for our future webinars as well. Uh, with that, I thank uh, all our speakers and uh, panelists today and, and the audience for joining us. Thank you and have a great uh, rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.